Hi everybody, my name's Jorn and I work for SUSE. And you are here to talk with me, or well, listen to me talk to you about securing your workloads in Kubernetes environments like AKS, which you should know because that's kind of what the title says. Although if you are surprised to be here, please stick around. I think this will be valuable, it'll be fun, and I will try to be uh, quick about it. So when we get to the topic of security, a lot of us are involved in security in one way or another. Nobody is not involved. And a lot of times we sometimes even hear the phrase, uh, well, you know, devs don't care about security, which I think is a terrible phrase to say. Of course we care about security. But there are a lot of things that are involved with securing our workloads. And especially that we now have multiple hats to wear, hats to wear inside of our environment. We can't cover all of the things. So today I want to narrow down and focus on something that you can do inside of your environment to secure those workloads and also in a way that's easy enough that it can actually be done bonus without breaking your entire infrastructure. So first of all, a thing I like to ask myself more than anybody else is what problem are we trying to solve? So before we get to the problem in containerized workloads like Kubernetes, we could actually talk about one of the great things inside of Kubernetes. And I'll be using the word Kubernetes sort of as a pronoun for containerized things. I mean, Docker counts, certainly uh, AKS, which we're all using is there. So Kubernetes it is. Inside of Kubernetes, which is infrastructure as code, which is primarily why you and I are using it, it makes it a lot easier to build up infrastructure so we can get our apps tested and get our apps into production very, very quickly. We don't have to open a ticket or beg for more resources or whip out our credit cards to buy more things. I have infrastructure. And one of the great things about it is the network inside of a Kubernetes cluster. If I'm a developer and I want my apps up and running, the network inside of Kubernetes is uh, flat and actually kind of invisible. That's good news for us. I deploy my app. They can communicate with each other from one pod, one container to the next. We're all big friends here behind the firewall inside of our entire environment. However, if I happen to be in the role of uh, compliance or security, or if I'm a platform engineer or operations, or certainly a networking person, the words like, oh, the network is generally flat and absolutely invisible, is terrifying, right? Attacks come from the network. That's where they are. That's where they instantiate. That's the place that we've been trying to do security for many, many years. This is not a new concept. So what we want to do is try to shrink that security boundary from we're all just friends here behind the firewall inside of our cluster and narrow it down to each and every workload. And what we're going to try to do is, and here comes a buzzword, is we're trying to establish a zero trust environment. I know we keep hearing that word, but let's establish what zero trust actually means. It's quite simple and it's also very tried and true, even though we've been only buzzwording on it for several years now. Zero trust really means that we have a platform, an environment, a concept, a framework, if you will, where things are not implicitly trusted. The answer is no implicitly until it is explicitly yes. An example of zero trust might be your banking account. My name's not on your banking account. How don't I steal your money? Well, that's because there's a very short list of people, you or maybe you and a significant other, who are allowed to touch your money in your bank and then nobody else. That is implicit deny everything until we explicitly allow things. That's zero trust. That's really what that means. Uh, the TSA line uh, at the airport is another great example of a zero trust environment. Nobody is allowed through until you explicitly prove that you are allowed through. Now you take something like a no fly list at the airport. That's not zero trust. That is actually a threat based methodology to security where we know what the threats are. We know that this, these people are not supposed to be flying on an airplane. In most environments, we want to take on a threat-based model and also a zero trust model. They are pillars of doing defense in depth where we want to assume our environment is compromised or could be compromised. What's the next line that comes through? But a lot of times we wind up in this push and pull from a security standpoint between agility and speed versus security where one breaks the other. I'm here to tell you that doesn't have to be the case. And in fact, not just tell you, I'm going to show you. Now, one of the tools I'm going to be using today is a solution 
called New Vector. It's been around for several years, and the founders of New Vector, actually one of them worked for VMware, another one worked for Fortinet and Fortigate, inventing those deep packet inspection and data loss prevention protocols in their firewall product, looked at environments, containerized environments like Kubernetes, and said, wow, that, that really is a problem, right? Not being able to see the network inside of your environment kind of constrains the way we can do security. Fast forward a few years later, they managed to create a product, get some patents wrapped around it, that gives you the ability to actually see the network inside of a Kubernetes environment. In fact, there aren't many other solutions that can do that. Additionally, and maybe even more importantly, is it's a single source of truth for the entire OSI model. So not just layer three and four looking at a port, but being able to see the protocol that any application is using. Why is that important? Now let's remember when we talk about zero trust, it's an implicit deny everything until we explicitly allow it. So what you wanna do and what I wanna do when we all scream for ice cream, we wanna be able to say, hey, this is the way that my application from a given workload and an application stack is supposed to behave. This is explicitly what is right. And we're gonna implicitly deny anything else around it. That's enough of me talking. Let's do a little bit of showing. So what I'm gonna to do today, and I've got my uh, new vector interface up, is I wanna show you directly inside in the new vector interface, I have three uh, Kubernetes clusters that I created. Uh, one we're gonna pretend is our dev test cluster, where of course we deploy apps and we test them. A QA cluster for doing things like QA. We're gonna test the tests. And then of course production, where our applications live and our customers are happy and they pay us money and that's how we're able to afford to eat. So I'm here inside of the new vector interface. This is not a new vector sales pitch and it's certainly not a new vector harbor tour. I'm gonna to go straight to that place where we do zero trust controls. And that's right here under policy and groups after I log back in. Told you this is a live demo. How are you today? All right, logging back in. Where was I? Policy, groups. So what New Vector does for you is it creates these groups around every single workload in your cluster. What's the problem we're solving here? Well, trying to establish security a traditional way using traditional tools becomes very, very challenging. Pods and containers, of course, are ephemeral. They're coming and growing. Their deployments are contracting and expanding all of the time. So we can't say, oh, it's this IP address here or it's running on that node over there. So the first thing we have to do is establish what these workloads are. And New Vector conveniently creates a workload or a group around every single deployment in your environment. Now, if I look here, I can see this is a rather boring looking environment because I just created a cluster and I haven't put any workloads in it. So let's solve that problem. Let's deploy an application to our environment. And the reason I wanna do that is not only show you how we're gonna learn things in the environment, I also wanna make sure that we're thinking about security from our workloads, narrowing it down and compartmentalizing our thoughts and our actions around security rather than trying to take on an entire cluster or an entire environment at once. That's too much, we'll never get it done, we'll procrastinate. So the application that I'm actually going to use is this uh, AKS store demo. Um, you can see it's here, it's on GitHub. This is my example app. I think that it's very cute. No, literally it's, it's actually uh, pretty cute. Uh, I'm gonna go, I'm pointing at my cluster right here. And so I'm going to, I've abbreviated the K for cube cuddle because I'm lazy and I don't like to type a lot. So I'm going to just deploy this app inside of my environment. Uh, here's my AKS store all in one. Yes, I meant apply. Apparently I can't type today, too much caffeine. So while we throw this application inside of my development cluster, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna deploy this workload uh, inside of my environment. Um, I'm going to just apply a YAML file that I already have that I grabbed you know, from this space. Here's the YAML, that's what that looks like. And then it's going to be this AKS all-in-one demo. And while I deploy that inside of my namespace, I wanna to talk to you about a couple of concepts that we're gonna see inside of New Vector in a moment. And that's the fact that New Vector is able to run 
groups in one of three modes. The first mode, and what's convenient about this tool is it actually uses names that make sense. The first mode is what's called discover mode. Now discover mode does just that. It discovers. This is the place where it watches all the behavior of your applications in a very passive way. The processes that run on containers and all of the network communication that happens inside of your environment. You don't have to do a thing. It learns it right away. And what are we doing? We're establishing the explicit allow list for the behavior of my application workloads in my environment. The other two modes that any group, now remember any group, not just the entire cluster, we can get down to a workload by workload example, we can also run in protect mode. Protect mode is no longer learning. It's going to enforce the policies that we've established. Remember, our policy is nothing unless the answer is absolutely yes. So if any activity, a process or a network connection, even a network connection that looked normal but was the wrong protocol, attempts to run in the environment, it will absolutely be stopped inside of your environment. Now, if you haven't tested it, that sounds scary. There is another mode that New Vector runs in, and that's something that's kind of right in between. And that's called monitor mode, which immediately <laughs> monitors for violations inside of your environment. It's like doing a dry run for protect mode. What's happening here is, again, it's no longer learning. It's going to monitor for violations of our rules, but it's not going to enforce them. So what we get to do is check to see, even after we've discovered some rules inside of our environment, make sure they're not going to break things when we're in production. We agreed earlier, that's bad. We don't want that. And monitor mode also has a wonderful side effect of being able to show you behavior about your applications that you didn't know before. You can affirm that your application is doing what it's supposed to do. With that being said, let's go back and check to see it in action. If I go back to my cluster right now, I'm just going to get the pods. Are they running? Oh my goodness, they're running. Let's go back to new vector and the interface inside of our environment. And if I go again onto policy and groups, remember these groups, new vector creates new ones as they come in and we'll see right here, I'll sort by namespace, this pets application is actually running inside of my environment. And you'll see that each one of these groups is in discover mode. This is the default mode of new vector when it installs your environment. And you can also change that later. But if we go here and learn things about it, we could see, oh, here's the front store. So for example, we can look and like, this is the pod with the container that's running in this environment. If I did a rolling update, those pods or containers would always land in this group. If I scaled it, they'd also be a member of this group. So this is where information about the behavior or application lives. You don't have to do anything about it. If I go over to process profile rules, I can actually see the processes that ran on these containers. And again, New Vector learned this by watching it. Same thing with network rules. I can see members of this store connected to the backend DNS did DNS lookups. And any time possible, New Vector is going to establish what that protocol is. In fact, since we're in our dev test cluster, uh, let's go swizzle the app around just a little bit, uh, give it a little exercise. So I'm going to just look up the services that are for my app. Should be a couple of here. Ah, here's the front end of that website. Let's go open that up in our browser right here. I told you this was going to be cute. Taking a little while to come over. See, adorable pet toys. That's my example workload. So I'm going to exercise my app like we would in dev test. Maybe I'll turn up the quantity on something and add this to my cart. Add that to my cart. Go look at my cart. Go do a checkout. Great. Dev test. Maybe let's go back and get that other service. I know that we've got a, a front end. Pull that up in my browser. Just like you would do with your applications when you're running them on your AKS clusters. There's my portal. I can, of course, add products. I could see what my orders are. And all this while, if we go back to New Vector and refresh, we should see that more things have happened. So from the store, for example, I can see that Ingress came in under HTTP, and there also was an 8080 connection. We're building that baseline for my applications. In fact, let's go take that uh, front end, go look at that container store front right here, have a little bit of fun. I'm gonna shell into that container. So 
how do these words know? It's exec dash it. Here's my container. And we're going to shell in. So that's the sh command. I'm in the container right now. In fact, if I go here and refresh my screen, we should see from a process profile standpoint, look at that right there. It knows that I shelled into the container. And because we're in discover mode, it added it to the manifest of things that are good about this environment. I could do a uh, who am I or an LS or even a uh, wget uh, susa.com because that's easy to type. All the while, while this activity is going on, new vectors making a record of what's supposed to happen inside of this environment. And every single one of my workloads have that nice candy-like shell of zero trust security wrapped around them. Now we could certainly take a group and we could change this group. Let's keep playing with this, this storefront here. I can switch modes. Remember, discover, monitor, and protect? I'm gonna switch this group to monitor. Remember, monitor is dry running against protect. It's not adding any active security, but it's certainly discovering different information. So we could edit this. Let's say I don't want people doing wget out of this container. I'm gonna delete that rule. This is an allow rule, remember. And let's go back and try running it again. wget, susa.com. It worked just like last time. Why? Because we're in monitor mode. Monitor mode, again, is not going to enforce the rules. And it's also not going to learn any new ones. But what it will do is it's going to notify us that something happened inside of my environment. Here it is right here. There's that wget that I ran inside of my world. Oh my goodness, how dare I? This, of course, can be sent off to uh, any sort of sim like Prometheus, Datadog, Splunk, whatever you're using inside of your environment. The other thing we could do is let's try throwing this group from a policy standpoint. Let's go take that uh, front end. There it is, storefront. And I'm going to just do nothing else but change it to protect mode. You're smart. You know what's going to happen, don't you? We're going to go run back here, and we're going to try to run it again. What should happen was killed. This is important. I'm actually root on this container because I'm using kubectl root for everybody. And new vector is able to stop this behavior from occurring. More pretending here. Let's pretend this was a false positive. Like, oh, we really wanted this inside of our environment. That's pretty easy to rectify. If I go back to my security events, because that's what this is, I can see in here, there's that wget just now. Here's the other one that I had run. In either one of those instances, if I want to just say, oops, that's okay, we really want it in our rule set, I don't have to roll back to doing discover and wait for the thing to happen again. I can just review this rule, add it to my rule set, and happily move on with my life. So now it'll actually be a part of that group. I'm going to go filter down here. Let's go just filter to my pets workloads. There's my storefront. There's my wget. It was user created. We could do the same thing with the network rules. We could edit network rules, add them, get them out of the way, and it would also stop it right on the wire inside of this environment. Very easy to do. But now that we've done this, now that in my dev test environment, what do I do with these rules? I certainly can change them here on the fly, but here's where a concept of security as code comes in. I think you're going to like it. So I'm going to go over to my other cluster. I have another cluster called QA. What do you want to bet I need to log back in again because I was busy wasting time? Oh, I'm all right. So you'll see here, looks like the other one. Not much going on inside of this environment. So back to my dev. I know they look the same, right? There's my QA cluster, changing my tab. There's my dev cluster. I'm going to take not only this rule, but let's just take the groups that are representing my entire application stack for the pets namespace and the pets store. I can take these rules and I can export them. So when I click on this button, I'm right away going to get the ability to make an assertion about what the output is going to look like in the file I'm just about to download. I could leave the mode of the groups in the way they are. And now you can see mixed mode. I got discover that one and protect. Or the other thing I can do is make an assertion that the in the export that these groups will be in a certain mode. Since I'm going to send this off to my QA cluster and I want to QA this behavior, I'm going to just assert that they are in monitor mode. 
And when I do so, I can either download a file. We also have the ability to send these rules off to a place like GitHub. So yes, you could GitOps this entire operation. Do polls against your security policy, your behavior. But for now, let's download it to a file, mostly because not only is it easy, but I want to save this right here and I'm going to open it up. There are all the rules that we just exported, right? For review, all of these became this file. What is this? It's YAML, language of the gods. This is actually a representation of a CRD or a custom resource definition, which is a way other applications can extend the capability um, of Kubernetes environments. A rancher is a very good example of using CRDs to further control things inside of your environment. Now, there are several things we can do with this file. The first thing, it's not necessarily the most important, but the first thing that happens is happening right now. Now, you may not be quite literally stroking your chin, but figuratively like, oh, look, what this is, is a manifest of the behavior of your entire application stack. At a minimum, you can go, oh, my application's behaving the way that it should. If let's say you're a security engineer or a platform engineer or whatever it may be, you could go to your developers and go, look, we, we wrote the security policy for you. Does this look right? Yes, cool, ship it with your code. May I have a piece of pizza? And see, we've created harmony in the land. But what's more powerful about this is taking this file and doing a security as code sort of machination. I know, you're like, Jorn, hurry up, get to it, show me the good stuff. All right, here comes the good stuff. Back over to my QA cluster. I'm gonna go to my terminal and I'm gonna exit out of that, con that container. And I'm going to just change my context to go over to that QA environment. So now that I've switched contexts to the appropriate Kubernetes context, this is my AKS cluster for my QA environment. All I'm gonna do is apply that file to this environment. So kubectl apply minus F, Yes, I'm looking at my keyboard when I type, you do too, admit it. We're gonna apply this inside of that pet's namespace. So on and on we go, each and every group gets its own configuration and gets sent back into that environment. If we switch over to Edge here for fun, we'll notice as we refresh the environment, and I'll sort this by the namespace, those rules are starting to get applied inside of this environment. So. We have these CRD rules. A couple of things that I want to point out to you that are very, very important. One, not only are they tagged as CRDs, you can see that they came in rather from a learn process, but followed that security protocol that we did before. Also, CRD rules get matched before learned rules as a matter of priority inside of your environment. That matters because maybe we were running some of this production and we possibly have learned some bad rules. We could take that nice clean room kind of example that I just showed you in my QA on something that's islanded and disconnected from the internet, apply the rules here, they'll land first. And equally as important, if I go back to things like that storefront and go look at my pro process profile rules, my network rules, not only are they in place, but even though I am admin on this cluster, I do not have the ability to go and change these rules. I have to follow that deployment methodology. In my example, I was just using kubectl commands to apply to my environment, but maybe you're using a CIDC process. You're probably using Azure DevOps. Good for you. We could actually take all of these CRD rules and ship them with our code. Now, there are a couple more bonus things that are very, very important here that I want to point out. Yes, more good news. This is very easy to do. And you can continue to do it inside of your environment, not just today, but as we go on, because a tool you don't use is less valuable than not having a tool at all. Would have agreed on that one. But the other thing that's actually more important here too is that new vector is very easy to install. Um, going over to the new vector docs, it's very easy to deploy using a Helm chart, which I like to do. Uh, you can certainly deploy it uh, using kubectl files. You could also go to the Azure Marketplace and press a button and load it right now and have it part of your environment when you get New Vector Prime, which is the retail version of it. Oh, did I mention? New Vector is completely open source. So you can have this tool inside of your environment today, 
for free. There's no pay to play to experiment with it, to see what it works like inside of your environment. And one more thing that I think is extremely important is the fact that New Vector deploys as a Kubernetes workload. There's no appliance. There's no SaaS that you have to subscribe to or for your data to get stove piped out against. It completely uses things that are native to Kubernetes. In fact, when I deployed it, I used a Helm chart and was able to get it up and running in my environment in about a minute. I'm not even joking. So if you want to give it a try today, very easy to do. Takes about a minute to install, like I said. And if you don't like it, delete it. It leaves no cone remnants behind. It doesn't have any sidecars to burden your environment. And if you want to know more, I would love for you to head off to things that we call rodeos. As a sister corporation under SUSE with a product you've probably heard of, Rancher, Rancher has these things called rodeos. And so too does New Vector. Rodeos are fantastic, free, and hands-on learning experiences where we give you a sandbox environment. We get to install all sorts of applications, use New Vector, break them in a lot more complex way. And all you need to bring is a modern browser and a cup of coffee cup of coffee optional. See, I told you that would be easy and it would be quick. It's also fast and it's free. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you have a great time at Build this year.